repairs that had to be done. We got about a third of them donated by Weld uh, Welch's Boiler Service. They're our Los Lunas company that does boilers all over the state. And they have the certified welders we needed. We got a small grant from BNSF in 2013 for $10,000, scraped up another seven, and bought only for the, the wages of the, of the operators uh, another batch of about a third of these that we had to do. Uh, so that was sort of an at cost uh, by that company. And then our own guys did the rest of them. Actually, there's one left. I hope it goes down Saturday. So you see he's unscrewed a cap here. And yeah, that's how you clean them out. You, put, you, you take an annealed copper gasket that's been domed so that you can get it down in the hole. And then if you have any sympathy for your successor, you, you give it a liberal coating of uh, anti-seize. And then the thing needs to be torqued down to collapse the copper, which forms the seal, uh, which holds the pressure uh, at that point in the water. Um, and it turns out we tried torque wrenching and things like that, but it doesn't work. Basically, you just keep, keep tightening it until it doesn't work. That worked for more than a thousand repairs. There were 29 of these bad boys that were so far gone we had to replace them entirely. This is no fun at all because that stay rod goes through to the inside and so the butt of it has to be ground loose so you can twist it out through the top. And then you weld a bolt to the top of the bad staple, or not to the top of the bad staple, and you get a big moosey guy uh, with a wrench and bring the thing out. It's, uh, oh, by the way, it's it's lovely doing this kind of work 16 feet off the ground. Uh, it gives a whole other <clears throat> And what you get is a bunch of nasty old stay rods with nuts welded to the top of them that didn't come that way. They need to be replaced. You completely grind off the, the sleeve, leaving just a hole through the boiler. And then on the inside, you start in with what's called a boiler tap. Uh, boiler threads, uh, if, if you're aware of them, are not cylindrical. They're actually conical. So the inside hole has to be tapped with a special tap that has that, uh, that pitch uh, to it, as well as the right threads. And that's an art form. I've, I've learned a lot about taps and dies. Uh, I also learned that they're brittle and if you drop them from 17 feet on the concrete, there's a 50-50 chance they'll break at 300 bucks a shot. And after that, the rod material that we're using had to be threaded on both ends. One end is going to capture a thing called a K-nut and the other one's going to capture on the boiler. So the assembly, these are old rods but new hardware, the assembly has something we call the apple and then this is called a K-nut for some stupid reason. Threads on over the end and then there's the cap. We're skipping the copper seal on that. Turn the whole thing sideways. This socket will be welded into the external part of the boiler like this and then with the rod sticking through it, you bring the nut down on the rod and then eventually capture the whole thing with, with the cap. You can tell which ones are repairs because they're straight cylinders and then these newbies have a, have a little waste to them. And there's a lot of them and it took a long time. When you got those all done and you think everything is ready, then you get your big screw air compressor that you've got from Intel for nothing and put $5,000 into it to make it run. And you start pressurizing the boiler. And you don't want to put a lot of pressurized air in a, in a vessel that could rupture. That's why the pressure tests actually were done with water and non-compressible fluid. Uh, we just put in enough air so that you can see who's leaking. And you have to go back and repair that one or do something about its seal. There's a number of different ways to attack. Is that so cold technique? Yes, sir, it is. <laughs> I got a lot of, of old Windex bottles and diluted uh, laundry detergent. It's a very clean machine. And as you're doing that, you, you hit it, anything that's leaking, you hit with a can of red spray paint, and then you send the crew back later to torque them down a little more, or in some cases, even have to hit it with a okay, so Here we go. And it's not always easy to get two places. Now stay! <laughs> <laughs> We like kids. We really like kids. We don't have enough of them. Let's skip subjects again because we're doing many projects in parallel. Brake shoes. 80 inch drivers. Nobody makes brake shoes for 80 inch drivers anymore. They don't have any. 
So if you want to drive a brake shoe, you can have one made. There's a place in Utah that will cast one for you. This is an old nasty one for the driver. These are for the trailing truck that goes underneath the cab. New, they look good, just in case somebody's having trouble with the concept. And nasty doesn't need to live. And our $1,000 brake shoes came back, and look at the way they fit. Oh, damn it. So we had to carefully advise the foundry that they got the wrong radius on these shoes and had them remade. So now they're, they're fine. Foundry was pissed, but at $1,000 a shoe, you know, you kind of want good stuff. Uh, that should basically take care of this locomotive until I'm dead. Uh, behind each shoe, there's a thing called uh, a brake head, which shoves the shoe on a big arm up against the tire to get the friction going and produce the stop. And they were all worn out. Those guys that said it was in great shape down in the park and all it needed was a little paint, they were so wrong. So the <laughs> points of suspension here on this brake head all had to be welded up and ground down. And they had to have a perfect radius to match the back of the shoe. How the hell do you do that? Well, getting it built up's not a problem. We got a CNM welding student working with us who was actually doing some build-up for us. What you need is what is called the transmogrifier. <laughs> Those of you who study literature understand that in the days of alchemy, transmogrification was to mysteriously change something, preferably lead into gold. So we built a transmogrifier out of a post grinder, some wheels from an industrial printer, uh, some other things. So we can throw a perfect radius on the built up welded cast and then check it and then check it again. And now they fit perfectly. This is kind of do it for yourself time. Then get the damn things on. They're really heavy. Brake shoes weigh about 90 pounds. You have to lay on your back and push up to get them into place. And eventually, here from the inside, that brake head and shoe is now applied against the wheel. From the outside, you see them hanging down with the new shoe here. And I'm not even going to try to tell you what it takes to rehabilitate one of those, those arms. And when everything's done, then there's a certain amount of balancing. All the brake systems are actuated by air. So you have brake cylinders which are uh, using 90 pounds of air pressure to throw some big levers and turn some big bell cranks to shove the shoes up against the tire. So what do we got? Let's change gears on you again. Anybody ever heard of the number eight brake stand? What the hell is that? Um, turns out in the old days they had a very simple air brake stand in the cab that was used to control the brakes for the locomotive and the train. And it was called a number eight. Well, they're archaic, you can't get them fixed, you can't get the pumps and the reservoirs certified. So if you especially want to run in a modern environment and you want to be able to control the diesel engine behind you from the cab, you go for what's called a 26L brake system. There are a whole bunch of funny little reservoirs and valves and plumbing. We've learned to use uh, swedge lock plumbing. It's really expensive. But there are more than, there, well, there's, to date, there's 57 pieces of swedge lock snaking their way back and forth between various valves, reservoirs, and different kinds of actuators to control this whole thing pneumatically. It's really brilliant engineering. I just don't understand it. Insulation was easy. All the pipes were wrapped with with belts of asbestos, can't use that anymore. Now you use stuff that comes in a shoebox about this big. It's a ceramic tape, looks like a wet belt. And a shoebox, conventional shoebox, costs you about $300. And you need many shoeboxes because everything's got to get wrapped. And then once it's wrapped, you paint it and it's insulated. Here's the 26L brake stand in the cab, more of these flexible swedge lock pneumatic lines. And the problem is the cab gets crowded. And if you've got a chubby engineer, he doesn't have a lot of room to sit around on this equipment. That's okay. The thing has a distributed lubrication system. Oh my God, what a wonder. You see the old movies, the, the, the engineers with their long spouted oil cans, oiling all the little places on the locomotive. Our big brothers in California with the 3751 locomotive stop every 125 miles and oil everything by hand. We just had to rebuild the, the lubrication system. There are three big pumps. Each has a five-gallon oil reservoir. And each one is parked somewhere on the frame, connected to everything in the world by these heavy wall copper lines. And as the valve gear articulates, the little pump ratchets around, and 
and squirt, 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 boil heads off, and a bunch of 